David Drucker of Roll Call is my colleague and co-host this evening. Mr. Drucker, we're concerned about the economy, deeply concerned about the economy and its struggle here in the first quarter. And we're joined by a member of Congress, you know him very well, Thaddeus McCotter of 11th Michigan. That's Livonia, that's Western Detroit. He also is concerned about the economy. Congressman, good, good evening to you. David and I have been obsessing about the 1.8% GDP growth reported for the first quarter and the consensus from Bloomberg that the rest of the year will only show a 2.9% GDP for the whole country. That is below what we need to replace jobs in any fashion. Is this, to your mind, Congressman, a reversal of fortune that we had not expected? Good evening. Uh, good evening, guys. I think that what you see when you look at some of the mood of the country as reflected in some of the surveys that have been taken. The American people overwhelmingly still believe we're in a recession because they're saying that their neighbors aren't getting jobs. They're measuring it by what I believe is accurate, is the unemployment still continues to be persistent and high in this country. You couple that with the fact that now government is talking about raising taxes. You couple that with the high energy prices. And then you finally add in the fact that though there's been much talk on both sides of reducing the size and scope and cost of a non-sustainable government at this point, uh, little has been done to really address it. So when you add those factors up, you're talking about people who do not see where there's a long-term plan for the economic prosperity of this country being allowed to come to the fore. David? When you return, Congressman, from the recess next week, do you expect the House of Representatives to focus on trying to deal with some of these these economic indicators that are troubling, or do you think that, that the Congress is simply going to remain sort of caught up in the spending cut or not to cut spending issue? And, and aside from that, do you think the nature of the House is equipped, in a sense, to deal with an economy that seems to be uh, zigging and zagging and, and not really letting us know exactly where it stands? Well, those are very good questions, but as you know, the circumstances sometimes intervene, and you're going to have a, a lot of a focus, rightly so, on the debt ceiling and what needs to be done uh, to reduce the scope of government and the spending of government in relation to the debt ceiling vote that's coming up. I think you're also going to see the continuance of the House Republicans to press for an all-the-above energy strategy, where we need to increase domestic energy production to help lower the cost of that, which is helping to drive core inflation. It also obviously goes into the fixed costs of businesses that are looking at potentially hiring or expanding. And that's problematical, especially here for a manufacturing state that is very energy dependent. When you start to look at some of the tax policies that come forward or some of the policies that may not be considered uh, necessarily um, in terms of spending reductions, but in terms of freeing up the ability of the economy through regulatory relief or other burdens that aren't necessarily directly viewed as a spending cut, I think those are critical to be done, and I think they will be done. But again, I the number one issue coming back in terms of what happens with the direction of the country is going to be the debt ceiling, and that's going to have an impact as well on the overall direction of the economy. Congressman, yesterday, Ben Bernanke, in the first ever press conference during his time as chairman of the Federal Reserve, used the word transitory when he was asked about food and fuel, about inflation, but especially food and fuel. Uh, transitory, I know what it means, and I can translate what he man, means, but to the American people listening to the sound bites or to the a summary of Mr. Bernanke, it sounded like the Federal Reserve was saying it doesn't matter that the price of gasoline is well through $4 throughout the country. It doesn't matter that the price of meat, that the price of bread is uh, staggeringly high compared to where it was a year ago at this time. Uh, does Washington connect with what's going on in America, Thaddeus? You've spent, you're out of session now. You're back in Detroit. Does Washington know what's going on in uh, big town and little town America? Well, I would say that the use of the term transitory in relation to how things cost the average family is probably an indication that he might not be as connected as he should be. I would think that a lot of Americans would hope his tenure at the Fed becomes very transitory as quickly as possible. And I think that when you talk about how Americans view their government, it's not my opinion. They view them as disconnected from the reality that, ev that everyday people are facing. So when someone comes on and says that, the prices are going up, but it's core inflation. They don't care whether it's core inflation. All they know is that things cost them more. They also know that for decades now, the wages have remained relatively slow in increasing for the average wage earner. And that, in combined conjunction with this new round of inflation that we're facing, is very, very painful to them. And they're surrounded in many states like mine where you see people where the housing market remains depressed, where you see that the employment is remaining high and persistent, more so than the rest of the country. 
And when you see somebody like Bernanke say it's transitory, it just means to them, if you translate it, it means, well, yeah, it's a problem for you, but not for us, and so we hope you get through it. And that's certainly not something that endears him or engenders any type of confidence in his tenure there. David? Uh, Congressman, have you gotten any sense during the recess whether the debate over government spending and, for instance, uh, the budget that the House Budget Committee under Paul Ryan put out has registered um, back at home, let alone whether people agreed or disagreed with the plan? And in, in all of the discussion that we're having here about economic indicators and, and how big or small government should be, do you think it's necessary for Republicans to talk in terms of economic growth uh, first and the intellectual discussion about government spending second? Well, I think they're tied together, but I think you're also right. The emphasis in the, and the articulation of the reason for spending reductions and entitlement reform and why we can no longer continue the non-sustainable, massive government welfare state that's been erected over the past several decades is because it is preventing economic growth, it is preventing jobs, it is directly hurting the hearth of home by endangering jobs or by preventing individuals from being able to go out and find a new one. And I think that when you start to get into some of the budget discussions especially, what will happen is people don't care about numbers, they don't care about statistics, but they want to see your results and they want to see how concretely what you're doing is going to tie to the future pursuit of their happiness and potential for prosperity down the road. Too often people get into bullet points and charts and talk. Now look, you know, I'm from Detroit. I enjoy a good bullet point as much as the next guy, which is I really don't. Just show me, get it going, get it going. Let me see the results in my neighbor's life and my life, and then we'll take it from there. But we're not connecting those dots, even though we know that intellectually they may be. As a practical matter, they've yet to be shown, and they've yet to be articulated properly to people who are waiting to see what the plan is going to be. We're speaking with Thaddeus McCotter. He's the author of the new book, Seize Freedom, American Truths and Renewal in a Chaotic Age. Congressman, you write in human events, within these last hours, in fact, that the, you write uh, the campaigner-in-chief, I believe you're referring to the president, and his host of leftist lemmings are again stereotyping Republicans as everything but American. Is it working, Thaddeus, that the president can regard the Republican Party as ruthless and cruel and wants to push Down syndrome children off of health care, as he said, actually said at the George Washington University address two weeks ago? I don't think it works, and I don't think it works for, for some of the very reasons I laid about about the budget discussions. Again, the Americans are very practical people. They know Republicans and Democrats castigate each other on a daily basis. And the volume may vary, but the narratives remain the same. So what happens is I think they're going to measure people by what they put forward and how it affects them, and they'll measure the proposition as opposed to getting lost in the weeds of the motivations of which side put it forward and what they really want to do. Sometimes what you find in political discourse is when you make an allegation that is just so non-believable, uh, that it actually hurts you when you make it. So, to, so for people to say that uh, one side or the other hates kids or hates seniors, people know that that's ridiculous. And so it doesn't really help you at this point. And again, it's the practicality and the salience of anything you put forward. It has to register with the American people, and they'll cut through the can't to see it. And I say that as someone who you know, I was young at the time, but watched Ronald Reagan get accused of everything under the sun. The people seem to respond when his policies worked. David, final question for you. Um, how would you rate so far the leadership of Speaker John Boehner and your leadership team? You have spent some time in leadership. Do you think you guys are getting it done, or at least as much as you can, um, in the few short months you've been in office? Well, I think it's one of those things that people like to do, and I'll say the same thing I said about President Obama when people ask me that question. I'd say it's really going to be judged by the, by the electorate. It's going to be judged in the House by individual members' constituencies over the long haul, whether they did or did not do their job for the two years they were elected. I think we have enough people trying to play the political game. How are you doing? How do you grade it? Look, we'll be judged by our constituents over the course of the next two years, and they'll either feel that we were being helpful, they're feeling that we didn't do the job, and that applies to both sides. So to me, it's, it's kind of an academic question. It's kind of like the pre-draft buzz like we had with the Detroit Lions. We need a defensive back, somehow we wind up with a defensive end. Hard to say how these things work out. How the Lions do it in the draft, that is. We were very, you know, got a good player, but we were looking at Prince Nakamura out of Nebraska. He was on the board, and the Lions didn't take him. We still don't have a lockdown corner. It's very disconcerting. That is McCotter, a U.S. representative, the 11th Michigan. Seize Freedom is his book, American Truths and Renewal in a Chaotic Age. The Detroit Lions is his team. 
David Drucker of Roll Call. I'm John Batchelor. 